Uh, hi, everybody. I'm John Horgan. I am director of the Center for Science Writings here at Stevens Institute of Technology. And in addition to organizing these uh, lectures by uh, very prominent authors, I also teach science writing here at Stevens. And I encourage writers to challenge their readers, to disturb them, and to take risks. I sometimes say if that that if your writing doesn't make anybody mad, maybe you're playing it too safe. This principle applies or should apply to academic scholars as well as to journalists. Isn't the point of academia to provide researchers a place to take intellectual risks? No one can accuse today's speaker of playing <laughs> it safe. Naomi Oreskes, who is an historian of science at Harvard, is one of my favorite intellectuals and academic scholars. I first encountered her work just over 30 or almost 30 years ago, when she co-wrote a paper in science that raised questions about the validity of computer models in science. That paper stirred up a ruckus. Oreski stirred up a much bigger ruckus with her 2010 bestseller, Merchants of Doubt, which exposed the ultra ideologues behind the denial of global warming. Some of these same people had also cast doubt on the link between smoking and cancer. I brought Oreskes to Stevens in 2015 to give a talk on Merchants of Doubt. I'm bringing her back today. And by the way, she's in a very elite group of speakers that have come <laughs> Stevens twice. I, I'm bringing her back to talk about her new book, just came out. Here it is, the big myth, which reveals how free market ideologues sold us the lie that unrestrained capitalism is good for us. Like Merchants of Doubt, the big myth is co-written with historian Eric Conway. And like Merchants of Doubt, the big myth is already provoking widespread debate. I love this book. It's thoroughly researched and rigorously reasoned, as was uh, Merchants of Doubt, but it's also a page turner which seized with passion and a righteous anger that I think makes it a really compelling read. You might expect the, uh, the business media to be uniformly critical of the big myth because of its critique of free markets, but the Financial Times gave it a great review. The Financial Times says, quote, if today's executives want to address the tensions about their company's role in our societies, the big myth suggests one starting point for business to stop pushing the idea that the only role of government is to get out of the way, unquote. After per Professor Oreski's presentation, she'll answer questions if there's time. You can submit those questions via chat. Now, Naomi, the screen is yours. And welcome Thank to Stevens. Thank you so much. Thanks for that generous and provocative introduction. Um, I'm so glad to hear that the book is a page turner. It reminds me of a story. When Merchants of Doubt came out, it was reviewed in the West Australian which is the largest newspaper in Perth, Australia. And they said the book was a riveting page turner. And my daughter, who was about 15 at the time, said to me, boy, mom, life must be boring in West Australia. So I hope that life is not boring in Hoboken. And with that, I will get started. So let me share my screen. Uh, we go to, uh, okay, can you see that? Yes, I can okay. see that, we can see let it. Me Okay, great. All right, good. So uh, as as uh, John just said, I'm going to talk to you today about my new book with Eric Conway, The Big Myth. And I'm going to start in 1988. Some of you might be old enough to remember that 1988 was the year that climate scientist Jim Hansen first testified in the US Congress that global warming was underway. Four years later, President George H.W. Bush signed the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which committed governments to preventing dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. And the president called on world leaders to translate the written document into, quote, concrete action to protect the planet. But that didn't happen. So what happened? Why didn't we act on the science? Why didn't we take those steps that President Bush promised us? <laughs> 
Well, in previous work, as John just told you, Eric Conway and I showed that the answer was not for lack of scientific information and not for lack of clear communication. In fact, the emergence of the scientific consensus on climate change in the late 1980s, sorry, that's a typo, not 08, 80s and early 1990s, triggered a politically motivated campaign to cast doubt upon the science and to block political action. So that today, climate change has become the climate crisis. So this is the story that Eric and I told in Merchants of Doubt, the story of a cadre of scientists who cast doubt on science and not just climate science, but a whole set of issues, including the harms of tobacco use, the reality of acid rain, the threat of ozone depletion. And so the question we wanted to answer was why? Why would educated, intelligent people deny basic scientific findings, especially about something as well established as the harms of tobacco or as consequential as the ozone hole? The answer we found was politics. Science denial had nothing to do with the science. And by that, I mean, it wasn't based on problems in the science, like inadequate data, or uncertain models, but it had everything to do with political ideology, specifically the ideology of market fundamentalism. So what is market fundamentalism? Well, we define it as belief in what Ronald Reagan called the magic of the marketplace, the idea of the power and efficiency of the free market. And it's coupled to hostility to government action in the marketplace, especially regulation. Market fundamentalists insist that government needs to quote, get out of the way, and let markets do their magic. One telling example of this involves tobacco. So one of the merchants of doubt was a man named S. Fred Singer, who was a physicist and in fact, a Cold War rocket scientist. In the 1990s, Singer worked with the tobacco industry to challenge the scientific evidence of the harms of secondhand smoke. By that time, secondhand smoke had been shown in literally thousands of peer-reviewed scientific papers to kill hundreds of thousands of people every year, including infants and children. So why would anyone defend a product that killed children? Well, Singer explained it in his own words. If we do not carefully delineate the government's role in regulating dangers, there's essentially no limit to how much government can ultimately control our lives. The argument was that if we allow government to compromise any freedom, including the freedom to smoke, we risk losing all freedom. And therefore, even, the, even a seemingly good regulation, like restrictions on smoking, is actually bad. Regulations like this put us on a slippery slope to government control of our lives, in Singer's mind, and specifically Soviet-style totalitarianism. Put another way, the market fundamentalists argue that any compromise to the free market economic system poses a threat to our democratic political system. Now, this could be deliberate, and market fundamentalists often refer to environmentalists as watermelons, green on the outside, but red on the inside. And this would explain then why a scientific issue like the harms of tobacco or carbon pollution gets, quote, politicized. But they also believe that it could be inadvertent that it's a slippery slope. And so then they sometimes refer to what they would call liberal do-gooders. And they think that in some ways, the liberal do-gooders are even worse because well-meaning people end up doing serious damage. In short, what we found was that the merchandising of doubt was driven not by epistemic concerns about the science, not by weaknesses or instabilities in the science, but by politics, by political commitments to laissez-faire economics, the belief in a fundamental link between free market capitalism and personal freedom. And in the 1990s, this would be reduced to the claim, capitalism is freedom. So where did market fundamentalism come from? All good research leads to new questions. And so at the end of writing Merchants of Doubt, we wanted to know why did so many people accept this idea so strongly? that they would reject well-established scientific evidence of serious harms like tobacco-based death and disease and the damages of climate disruption? And why would they reject the need for government action to address these very real and serious problems? So that is the story that we now, five years later, tell in The Big Myth. The history of a conscious program by American business leaders to promote market fundamentalism in academia, in popular culture, and in politics.
In Merchants of Doubt, we showed how many of the same think tanks, PR firms, advertising agencies, and even some of the same people were involved in attacking the science showing the harms of tobacco, air pollution, and fossil fuels. In The Big Myth, we take the story back further. We show that the same leaders, sorry, this is my screen, I can't see the top of my own slide, but I think I know what it says. We show that many of the same groups and conservative business leaders um, argued for market fundamentalism in order to limit government protections for labor, including child labor, to prevent or limit regulation of industry, such as including the electricity industry, the tobacco industry, to protect the private sector from responsibility for ex the external costs of their products like air pollution and climate change, to persuade Americans that the American way of life is inextricably bound to free enterprise, and to introduce the notion of free enterprise, which previously had been known as private enterprise, to argue that any compromised economic freedom threatens our other freedoms. And this then culminates in the election of Ronald Reagan, who remakes the Republican Party to turn against government and to argue that, quote, government is not a solution to our problem. Government is the problem. And he argued that the solution, the real solution lies in the magic of the marketplace, a conclusion that we argued has influenced Democrats and the American people broadly as well. So that's the background to the story. And telling the story of the big myth has required a big book, over 500 pages. What I want to do in my talk today is to offer, offer a portion of this history that invites us to consider how we have come to rely too much on markets and not enough on government to address economic and social needs. So let me say a bit more about exactly what the myth is. Like all good myths, the big myth embeds several sub-myths. The sub-myth number one is that the market exists unto itself, that it has agency and even wisdom. So the idea that there is even such a thing as the free market, which exists outside of civil society. The reality is that people make markets. Markets are human institutions. They've been around since biblical times. And people have been setting the rules under which they operate for just as long. So if you know your Old Testament, you know that there are discussions in the Old Testament about how, how markets should operate. There has never been such a thing as the free market. So just the whole notion of the construction of the free market is the first step in the myth. The second sub-myth is the idea that governments cannot improve the functioning of marketing. It can only interfere. Governments therefore need to stay out of the way lest they quote, distort the market and prevent it from doing its magic. The reality is that governments have always been involved in markets and in many cases have created markets, improved their functioning or filled needs that markets left unfulfilled. And the third part of the myth is what we call the indivisibility thesis. This is the idea that capitalism and freedom are indivisible and therefore any compromise to economic freedom threatens political freedom. And this is why these people argue that the government needs to, quote, stand back and let the market do its magic. The reality is that history has on multiple occasions proved this to be untrue. So what I'd like to focus on today is this third part of the myth, the argument linking capitalism and freedom, because this is an argument that has been central to American conservative ideology since the 1930s, so for nearly 100 years, and it continues to inform it today. So this part of the story begins in the 1930s with ex-president Herbert Hoover. Most people know that Hoover lost the US presidency to FDR in 1932, and many people think of Hoover as a discredited president because of his failure to respond adequately to the Great Depression. But in fact, Hoover remained highly influential in the Republican Party and in conservative and business circles. And in 1934, he wrote a book, The Challenge to Liberty, which became a central text for American business interests trying to fight back against the reforms of the New Deal. And he wrote, quote, it holds both in principle and in world experience that intellectual and spiritual freedoms cannot thrive except where there are also economic freedoms. It insists equally upon protections to all these freedoms or there is no liberty. Some years later, this would be simplified and glossed by J. Howard Pugh, the president of the Sun Oil Company, known to us today as Sunoco, 
Uh, Pew was also a major uh, leader in the National Association of Manufacturers, who I'll say more about in a minute. He glossed this as, quote, the indivisibility thesis. In a letter to Rose Wild Lane, an important libertarian thinker at this time, also the ghostwriter to her mother, Laura Ingalls Wilder, uh, which we talk about at some length in the book, uh, Pew wrote, quote, I believe that freedom is indivisible. When a part is taken away, that which remains is no longer freedom. To illustrate, suppose we should lose our industrial freedom. Then it would require a compulsory form of government in order to enforce the degrees having to do with the conduct of industry and a compulsory state can brook no freedoms. So here's an articulation very succinctly of the slippery slope argument that even a small compromise to industrial freedom, and it's not a coincidence that he uses the example of industrial freedom because that's what he's fighting for, the freedom of businesses to run their businesses uh, independent of government regulation or oversight, that if that's permitted, then we will all lose our freedoms. And therefore it's in the interest of the American people to defend the freedom of big business. Now, as I said, Pew was a leader in the National Association of Manufacturers, which was at the time the largest trade association in the United States, still active and important today. In the 1920s, NAM had fought child labor laws, and today they continue to fight against climate policy and carbon pollution regulation. In the 1930s, they had launched a multi-million dollar propaganda campaign targeted at teachers, religious ministers, other community leaders, and ordinary Americans to promote the indivisibility thesis. This propaganda campaign included press releases, push polls, integration propaganda, films, newsletters, magazines, cartoons, posters designed to be displayed in classrooms and the factory floor, and more. A central theme of this propaganda campaign was the idea of a tripod of freedom. In 1939, NAM issued a Declaration of Principles in which it articulated this idea. And again, this is 1939, so right, uh, and it was December of 39, so right after uh, World War II had broken out. NAM wrote, quote, in a world torn by war and dictatorship, Americans live at peace and in freedom. The best assurance that we shall remain free and at peace is our own internal unity and strength tied to our faith in constitutional representative government, in free enterprise, and in civil and religious liberty as inseparable fundamentals of freedom to be cherished and preserved. So here you see the crux of the argument um, that free enterprise or economic freedom is on a par with representative government and the freedoms enshrined in the Bill of Rights. Now, this idea was promoted in various formats and venues, but most aggressively and probably most successfully in a syndicated radio program called the American Family Robinson. So this was a radio program building on the themes of the Swiss Family Robinson, emphasizing individual initiative and the idea that the New Deal uh, was sapping American individualism and American enterprise. So the program extolled the virtues of free enterprise capitalism and vilified FDR and the New Deal. According to NAM's own description of this program, the program's, quote, avowed purpose is, quote, to present openly and as effectively and attractively as radio will permit the fundamental principle that freedom of speech and of the press, freedom of religion and freedom of enterprise are inseparable and must continue to be if the system of democratic government under which this country has flourished is to be preserved. And the central metaphor of a tripod is meant to imply that if even if one leg is taken away, like the leg of industrial freedom, then the whole uh, edifice, the whole structure will crumble. Now, the American Family Robinson was a very successful program. We know it was syndicated in over 300 radio stations around the country, but Pew and his colleagues faced three problems. The first was that the indivisibility thesis wasn't true. Free enterprise was not part of the foundation of the United States. The term appears nowhere in the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution. And in fact, government was deeply involved in the American economy throughout history. Uh, and in the book, we give examples of that. A second problem was that the argument was hypocritical. 
Nam, Pew, and Herbert Hoover were arguing for businessmen's freedom to set wages and working hours in their factories, but they bitterly and sometimes violently fought against workers' freedom to unionize or to engage in collective bargaining. And it was self-serving. In the 1940s, uh, or even in 1939, memories of the Depression were still vivid and bitter. As historian Wendy Wall has noted, in the wake of the economic collapse of the Great Depression, the, quote, narrative of capitalist-driven growth seemed questionable at best, a monstrous delusion at worst. So how would they make the American people believe this argument that wasn't true, it wasn't supported by the facts of history, it wasn't supported by the recent experience of the Great Depression, and it was patently self-serving uh, and hypocritical? Well, one part of the solution was to recruit academics, to recruit intellectuals, to boast, bolster the case, to try to give it intellectual bona fides. And so a set of business leaders linked to NAM recruited two prominent Austrian economists to come to the United States, and they financed positions for them at leading American universities, specifically NYU and the University of Chicago. They then produced simplified versions of their argument that were heavily promoted in popular context, and they funded additional academic work to refine the argument and carry it forward. The two economists were, the two European theorists they brought were Friedrich von Hayek and his mentor Ludwig von Mises. If you know anything about the history of economics, you know that they are considered to be two of the founders of neoliberalism. Particularly important was von Hayek, whose 1944 book was essentially a sophisticated articulation of the indivisibility thesis. It focused on Soviet communism and the risks of centralized planning, but it also suggested that even if a non-communist society like the United Kingdom or the United States compromised economic freedom by moving towards social democracy, and he uses the specific example of the British national health system, it will soon be on what he called the road to serfdom, the loss of all freedoms based on this compromise to economic freedom. Well, needless to say, this made business executives in the United States very happy because they saw how this could be used to support their own position. Now, Von Hayek's argument was focused on Europe, particularly on Soviet communism, but it had an obvious resonant in the United States and the argument that these business leaders had already been trying to put forth. So they bring Hayek to America. And one of the ironies I love in this story is these same business leaders are constantly criticizing socialism and communism as foreign theories, but here they are actually importing foreign theorists. So in 1945, a group of captains of American industry associated with NAM had created a new group, the Foundation for Economic Freedom, sorry, the Foundation for Economic Education, which was America's first libertarian think tank. The people associated with this included some of the most famous names in American business history. Besides J. Howard Pugh, it included David Goodrich of Goodrich Tires, Henry Ford II, General Motors' Charles Kettering, but also two less well-known names, DuPont executive Jasper Crane and Missouri businessman Harold Lunnell, the head of the Libertarian Volcker Fund. In 1945, Crane and Lunnell brought von Hayek to America, first on a book tour and then as a professor at the University of Chicago. In the spring of 45, Harold Leno paid for Hayek to come to the United States on a five week book tour, which included an appearance in New York's town hall and an estimated audience of 2000 people and a radio broadcast. And I wanna say, by the way, if any of you are very rich, I would be happy to accept money for a five week book tour, uh, but that doesn't generally happen. So. On this tour, Hayek had the opportunity to make his own case directly to the American people. But that would soon change as these business admirers began to make the case for him and in their own way. Now, Hayek's argument was certainly pro-market, but it's important to note that it was also nuanced in several important ways. He wrote in The Road to Serfdom, the successful use of competition as the principle of social organization precludes certain types of coercive interference with economic life, but admits of and even requires others. So what were some of these forms of legitimate interference in the marketplace? Well, he has a fairly extensive list. It includes things like signposts on roads, preventing the harmful effects of deforestation, 
of some methods of farming or the noise of smoke and factories. It includes prohibiting the use of certain poisonous substances or to require special precautions in their use, limiting working hours, enforcing sanitary conditions in workplaces, controlling weights and measures and preventing violent strikes. So in other words, we see a significant role for government uh, in, a, in, for example, addressing pollution or unsafe workplaces. And he also argued for some form of social insurance or social welfare programs. He wrote, there can be no question that adequate security against severe privation and the reduction of the avoidable causes of misdirected effort and consequent disappointment will have to be one of the main goals of policy. And Hayek explicitly rejected the argument for laissez-faire. He wrote, it is important not to confuse opposition against planning, and by that he means central planning, as in Soviet-style five-year plans, not to confuse that with a dogmatic laissez-faire attitude. The liberal argument is in favor of making the best possible use of the forces of competition as a means of coordinating human efforts, not an argument for leaving things just as they are. But in the hands of his acolytes, Hayek's work was used as an argument for leaving things just as they are and defending the privileges of the status quo, the privileges of business owners. In fact, we argue in the book that it took on the quality of a religious faith. So Crane and Lunau loved Hayek's message, loved, loved, loved it, but they thought the book was too intellectual, too highbrow for an American audience. And so they helped to arrange for Reader's Digest magazine to publish a 20 page condensation. The text was accompanied by a set of quote, commandments of political and economic rights. And here you can see when we say it took on a kind of quasi religious uh, quality, it's not just a metaphor. They actually present a set of commandments um, and they show it, you know, these are presented like tablets similar to what Moses is said to have brought down from Mount Sinai. And so you can see um, it begins with the right to worship God in its own way, but includes the right to freedom from government regulation and control. Now, Lunau and Crane, and in the Reader's Digest version, the argument wasn't just shortened, which of course it would have to be if you take a 200 page book and reduce it to 20 pages, but it also involved key conceptual changes, focusing less on communism and much more on Nazi Germany, an enemy that of course every American in 1945 knew well. So what they wrote was, um, well, they quote, they quote from Hayek, fascism and what the Germans correctly call national socialism are the inevitable results of the increasing growth of state control and state power of national planning and of socialism. So in other words, now, instead of simply arguing that economic planning would lead to Soviet style communism, it can also lead to German style fascism. Now, this was a slate of hand, of course, because historically both German and other communists had been fighting the Nazis. Nazism and Soviet communism might have both been bad. I mean, indeed, they were both bad, but they were not the same thing. But in the Reader's Digest version of The Road to Serfdom, they're presented as exactly the same. So the World War II fight against European fascism, the American fight against European fascism, is now transmogrified into a fight against economic planning, which it never was, a fight against government engagement in the marketplace, and from there, a fight against social security, minimum wage laws, and other protections. In other words, all of Hayek's nuance and caveats were expunged, and all of his discussion of legitimate forms of, quote, interference in the marketplace were removed. And key phrases were also rewritten. So here's another example in the, the quote I gave you before about social security. In the original, he says, there can be no question that adequate security against severe privation and the reduction of the avoidable causes of misdirection effort and consequent disappointment will have to be one of the main goals of policy. But if these endeavors are to be successful and are not to destroy individual freedom, security must be provided outside the market and competition be left to function unobstructed. In other words, Hayek is explicitly acknowledging market failure, that the private sector doesn't provide social security and saying, well, that's okay. So we have to find a way to provide it outside the market. In other words, either through government or through private charity. 
But in the Reader's Digest version, this is reduced to, if we are not to destroy individual freedom, competition must be left to function unobstructed, period. Now, historian Bruce Caldwell notes that Hayek attempted on many occasions to make clear his desire for, quote, a clear set of principles which enables us to distinguish between the legitimate fields of government activities and the illegitimate fields. And he even instructed, quote, you must cease to argue for and against government activity as such. But arguing against government activity was exactly what his American backers did. And in doing so, they turned his argument, I would argue, into propaganda. And then they pushed it even further. They turned it into a cartoon. That is to say, literally a cartoon published in Look Magazine and distributed by General Motors. With only a trifle of text, The Road to Serfdom in Cartoons presents the entire simplified argument in 18 pictures and captions. In the cartoon version, the problem starts with World War II, where the federal government mobilizes the economy on behalf of the war effort, something that virtually all Americans supported. But according to the argument now presented, that government intervention in the marketplace ends up with totalitarianism. And you see on the right here, the final uh, cartoon, the, dissent, the dissenter is being shot by a firing squad. Now, why is this so important? Well, we know that in the 1950s, about 10 to 15 years later, Ronald Reagan read Friedrich von Hayek. And the historical evidence suggests that the version that he read was not the original book, but the Reader's Digest version. Moreover, we also know that these popularizations reached a huge audience. The original book had sold about 17,000 copies, and that was a lot of copies for a serious book and much better than the editors expected. But look circulation in 1948 was 2.9 million copies per issue. So we know that this landed on the coffee tables of nearly 3 million American homes. Reader's Digest had an even bigger circulation, nearly 9 million. And we know from the historical records that a million more copies uh, of this adaptation were distributed as a pamphlet, uh, which cost five cents but was in fact distributed free to many people. Now, just for comparison, the US population at that time was about 140 million. So it's plausible to conclude that they may have reached close to 10% of the American population just with this one piece of their propaganda campaign. But that wasn't enough for Leno and Crane. They wanted more. So in 1949, as I've already said, they brought Hayek's ideas, or at least a version of them to America. In 1948, they brought the man himself to America, arranging behind closed doors for him to be hired at the University of Chicago and to run a project that they would fund called the Free Market Project. So what we see here is that these champions of competition did not actually support a free market of ideas. There was no open search for these jobs, no competitive process for research funding, no peer review. Rather, they handpicked the participants, got them hired behind closed doors, and then, without external review, funded the research that supported their political ideology. So just a few words on how they did this. So we know, again, from historical documents that in 1948, Luno met personally with the president of the University of Chicago, Robert Maynard Hutchins, and that he promised he pledged $15,000 a year for 10 years to pay Hayek's salary. In 1950, Hayek was, in fact, hired, but not in the economics department. He was hired in the Committee on Social Thought because the economics department, in fact, did not want him. He was hired over the objections of the economics department. So what was the goal of this free market project? Well, it would be a program to promote, working stressing, to promote work stressing two main ideas. The first was the primacy of the free market. And again, this comes from historical documents. So these are their words. Uh, prom promoting the primacy of the free market as the most efficient organizer of society and explaining, quote, that the free market is systematic, rational, not chaotic or disorderly, and consistently efficient in allocating resources to their best use. It would also emphasize the relationship between capitalism and freedom, in other words, the indivisibility thesis, with an emphasis on regulation as, quote, a menace to the free market and therefore a menace to freedom generally. The project would be financed by Harold Luno via the Volcker Fund, and it would cover all the salaries of the academics. 
It would also cover the expenses of an advisory board consisting of persons sympathetic to the purposes, one of whom was Leonard Reed, the head of the Foundation for Economic Education. So again, not an academic, but a fellow ideologue. And the board would meet regularly in Chicago to monitor the progress of the project. And they would expect a specific deliverable. So in other words, they weren't just funding research, funding academics to do whatever academic work they thought most appropriate. Rather, they contracted that within three years, the participants would produce, quote, a semi-popular book, providing the blueprint for an effective co competitive system of free enterprise. The book would be the American version of the road to serfdom. It would be the Bible of market fundamentalism. And in a telling comparison, uh, Leno and Crane discuss how Mein Kampf was the Bible of Nazism and Das Kapital was the Bible of communism. And so this would be the, the Bible of market fundamentalism. Now, in the end, Hayek did not, in fact, write the American version of the road to serfdom. But another member of the Free Market Project would. And this work was also supported by the Volcker Fund. And that member was Milton Friedman. And the book was Capitalism and Freedom, published in 1962. Now, The Road to Serfdom and Capitalism Freedom are different books, but the central idea is the same. And in fact, uh, Friedman, in the introduction, you know, mentions his debt to von Hayek. The argument of capitalism and freedom is the indivisibility thesis, that capitalism and freedom are indivisible and inextricable. Now, it's important to note that both Friedman and von Hayek were economists, but the argument of these books is not primarily economic. That is to say, it's not primarily an argument in defense of free market capitalism as efficient means to deliver goods and services. In fact, there's almost no evidence even really pertaining to that argument. Rather, it's a political argument that capitalism and freedom are linked. So if we wish to preserve political freedom, we must maximize our preservation of economic freedom. And if we compromise our economic freedom by allowing government to control the marketplace, it's only a matter of time we lose our other freedoms, even if for a seemingly good cause. So here we have the Merchants of Doubt argument in a nutshell, published in 1962, um, that the same argument that we see the Merchants of Doubt making uh, 30, 40 years later. In other words, it is the indivisibility thesis, but now published by a leading academic in one of America's most prestigious universities. Now, Friedman was even more extreme than von Hayek. As we've already said, Hayek recognized a fairly wide berth for government action in the marketplace, including preventing pollution and providing for social security, but not Friedman. As historians Philip Murawski and Dieter Pluve have noted, Friedman denies almost any legitimate role for government other than organizing the military, maintaining law and order, enforcing contracts, defending property rights, and printing money and providing a monetary framework. He, in the book, he explicitly says that government should rarely pass or enforce laws against pollution, should rarely pass or enforce laws to protect workers, for example, workplace safety, or enforce antitrust laws or other regulations to control business practices, even if those practices appear to be anti-competitive. And he explicitly gives a rather long list of things the government should not do, such as regulating banks or regulating radio and television or support social security, or have a veterans administration, or pass minimum wage laws. He gives a pretty long list. Uh, and then he says the list is far from comprehensive. The reason, he argues, is that government action in the marketplace always compromises freedom. And therefore, the cure is almost always worse than the problem it seeks to remedy. So a kind of assumption that the compromise of freedom is worse than the protection that you get in exchange for it because of the slippery slope argument that you'll lose all your freedom. Bratsk and Pleve summarize by saying that the role of government is, quote, reduced to a skeleton. Now, let me pause here for a moment to say that if you're not yourself a conservative or libertarian, you may not know just how influential these books have been. And if you are a conservative, then please stay with me. Because the road to serfdom has been deeply, deeply influential, touted by many of America's most prominent conservative voices, such as Glenn Beck, Rush Limbaugh, 
the National Review, Tucker Carlson, Ted Cruz, Michelle Bachman, Paul Ryan. These are just some of the many uh, conservative Republican and libertarian thinkers, political leaders, celebrities who have cited this book. Von Hayek was invited to the White House by Presidents Bush and Reagan. And in 1991, he received the US Presidential Medal of Freedom. President George H.W. Bush call, called The Road to Serfdom, a book that, quote, still thrills readers everywhere. I have to say I'm a little suspicious that Bush actually read the book, or maybe he was just a weird guy, because I've read the book from cover to cover more than once. It's a very interesting book. It's worth reading. I would never really say that it was thrilling. Former Harvard secretary, and, but it's not just Republicans who have been influenced by this. Former Harvard secretary, uh, Harvard president and US Treasury Secretary Larry Summers has compared Hayek to Adam Smith, suggesting that the most important lesson of economics, which he attributes to Smith and Hayek, is that, quote, the invisible hand of the marketplace is more powerful than the hidden hand of government intervention. What Hayek stressed, he said, was that things will happen in well-organized efforts without direction, controls, and plans. That's the consensus among economists. That's the Hayek legacy. Capitalism Freedom was even more influential. Published in 1962, it is still in print. It's on the list of nearly every top 10 lists of conservative books and many top 100 books of all time, including Time Magazine, The Times Literary Supplement, and many others. Friedman became a columnist for Newsweek. He wrote hundreds of editorials, was an advisor to Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, won the Economics Nobel Memorial Prize. And in the 1980s, the book was made into a 10-part television series that we know was watched by millions of Americans. And in the Reagan administration, he was awarded both the National Medal of Freedom and the National Medal of Science. Indeed, I think it's fair to say that Friedman was arguably one of the most influential intellectuals of the 20th century. Today, his ideas are promulgated by a large network of free market think tanks and foundations, all of whom promote free market solutions to social and environmental problems, nearly all of whom have denied the scientific evidence of climate change, and many of which have been involved in anti-vaccine and anti-mask mandates for COVID-19. Now, how do we know that this was propaganda and not just legitimate political opinion? Well, for one thing, as we've already seen, Nam and others at the time described it as propaganda. By their own admission, Nam said that American Family Robinson was a propaganda program. But for another, the key argument was patently false. The indivisibility thesis is easily refuted by history because capitalism and freedom have not been inseparable. In the early history of capitalism, unregulated markets had produced a world of hurt and suffering, a world that was cruel and dangerous and included slavery, child labor, what William Blake called the dark satanic mills, brutal working conditions, often with literal starvation wages and no limits to the hours that employers could demand. So in other words, no freedom for the employers who worked in these satanic mills. In the United States, millions of workers were killed or seriously injured on the job every year. And one of my favorite statistics that I found in doing this research was that in 1914, it would have been safer for a young man to go fight in World War I, sorry, that's a typo, World War I, than to go to work in a mine or on the railroads. Capitalism had not brought freedom to the Americans enslaved in the South, nor had it protected the legal or political rights of female citizens. But a good deal of this suffering and denial of freedom had been remedied by law and regulation, and it did not lead to totalitarianism. In fact, if anything, it strengthened democracy and civil society by protecting the freedoms of workers, children, women, and Black Americans. And the free market hadn't even protected competition. When markets went unregulated, competition was often replaced by monopoly. Government stepped in to prevent bank panics and to remedy the cutthroat competition that had led to monopolistic practices. In 1890, the Sherman Antitrust Act outlawed monopolistic practices that, had, that were undermining free competition. And it's worthwhile to note that that law passed the Senate by a vote of 51 to 1 and the House by a vote of 242 to 0. And unregulated markets were bad for democracy as well. 
Monopolies and trusts had led to vast accumulations of wealth by robber barons who corrupted both markets and political systems. And we know if you actually read the, uh, the materials around the Sherman Antitrust Act, it was intended to protect democracy against corporate concentrations of power alongside its efforts to protect open competition. And of course, there was the Great Depression. The Great Depression proved that the free market did not guarantee prosperity. In fact, reckless financial speculation and unscrupulous business practice had played a significant role in the crash of 1929. But in both Europe and the United States, governments had stepped in to stop these practices through law and regulation. And this was widely hailed as progress. Um, and then here's just a few examples of some of the many laws that were passed in the late 19th and early 20th century uh, to protect against anti-competitive practice, to correct market failures, and to protect the innocent and the vulnerable. None of these reforms led either the US or the UK into totalitarianism. In later years, moreover, in 1973, Chile undertook economic liberalization under a brutal dictatorship that reduced freedom. So here you had capitalism without freedom. And in 1978, China is, began its open door policy, embracing market economics, but without political freedom in a twist that was so unpredicted that people needed to come up with a new name for it, which they developed the term market authoritarianism. Now, of course, in 1962, Milton Friedman didn't know what would happen in Chile or China, but he did know what had already happened in the US, that capitalism had not protected freedom. So to conclude, market fundamentalism is not restricted to the United States, but it finds its fullest expression and most wide ranging support here. And what we argue in our book is that this is neither coincidence nor historical contingency, but the result of a nearly century long propaganda campaign to persuade the American people of the efficacy and benevolence of markets and the inefficacy and malevolence of big government linked to the corollary insistence on the primacy of markets as protectors of freedom. The free market is in fact just a theoretical idealization. The real question facing us is not whether there's a role for governance in the marketplace, the real question is how we define that role, how we balance competing interests, competing freedoms, and how best to address market failures and remedy when they occur. And this is what links our new work to our previous work, because the ideology of the magic of the marketplace stands in the way of addressing many of our biggest problems. And recently we've discovered an unlikely ally along with the Financial Times in Klaus Schwab, the founder and executive chairman of the World Economic Forum. Recently, Mr. Schwab has written, free market fundamentalism has eroded workers' rights and economic security, triggered a deregulatory race to the bottom and ruinous tax competition, and enabled the emergence of massive new global monopolies. And of course, it's also led to the climate crisis. Or to put it more succinctly, quoting the words of the novelist Kim Stanley Robinson, the invisible hand never picks up the check. Thank you very much. If you were at Stevens in person, you'd have a big round of applause. Now, oh, thanks. You just have to settle for me. All right, so there are already some questions here. Thank you very much. Uh, that was a great overview of the, uh, of the major themes of your book. Um, let me see. Uh, there was a question about, this is from uh, uh, a Stevens professor of, uh, of history, James McClellan. Could you comment on uh, Republican and other business leaders resistance to uh, ESG investing? I I had to ask him what that is, but maybe you could explain to everybody. Yeah, but ESG refers to environment, social, and governance principles. It's the idea that the private sector should actually govern itself and embed into its operating strategies principles to protect the um, environment and protect social goods. And the Republican opposition to ESG, I think, in a way, is one of those tells that gives the game away. Because if you truly believe that we're better off having the private sector regulate itself and not have the government, you know, 
get involved in issues that perhaps it doesn't understand, then you should really welcome ESG, right? You should welcome the idea that corporations um, will take this responsibility on themselves and will implement um, policies to protect workers, protect the environments, address market failure. And if they would really do this, then maybe you actually wouldn't really need government regulation. So I'm a big supporter of ASG, most environmentalists I know are, but it's so telling that instead of embracing this, as you might think that they should, given their, their ideology, you see Republicans not only criticizing it, but actually trying to work with attorneys general to block ESG principles from being adopted. Um, so I think this really shows that there's a kind of incredibly cynical and venal aspect to this project, not not all of, you know, this is a certain sector of the Republican Party that is doing this right now. Um, that's really just about, you know, making money at all costs, and not even acknowledging the idea that the private sector has any responsibilities. Um, one of the thing, things Milton Friedman used to say was there's no such thing as the social responsibility of corporations, um, except to return value to shareholders. I think increasingly many people in the business community are rejecting that. Um, but you can see this as a tension within the market, uh, the pro-market camps. Um, there are some other questions here, but I just have one that popped into my head as you were speaking. How do you see the big tech companies? Uh, what what sort of role are they playing in the debate over uh, the you know the the relative balance of uh, free markets versus government programs, um, welfare programs, and and other uh, things like that? Do you think is B, big tech? I mean, it it in some ways seems very progressive, but is it also promoting some of these free market uh, principles? Yeah, absolutely. So in the book, we have a whole chapter on uh, telecommunications deregulation in the Clinton administration. And there's no question that deregulation of telecom was part of the emergence of big tech monopolies. We saw tremendous consolidation. And so now there are some, you know, as you know, really big questions being raised about how we should think about big tech companies like Elizabeth Warren says, we should think of them as utilities and they should be regulated because they're essentially monopolistic. I've What I find interesting is two things. Um, in Silicon Valley in general, you see people tend to be highly libertarian, highly market fundamentalist. And you know, there's another part of this myth that they promote, which is the myth of the guy with the hoodie in his garage uh, creating technological innovation when we know, and in the book, we talk a little bit about this, how much of the important technological innovation of the 20th century and even the late 19th century was driven at least in part, if not wholly, by the US federal government. So they create a myth about individual entrepreneurs that is not supported by the history of technology. But um, so I do definitely see Silicon Valley as, you know, continuing to carry this myth forward into a sort of 21st century version. In terms of the specific company, and of course, Elon Musk has been you know, an extreme market fundamentalist ideologue. I mean, he's a big fan of merchants of doubt. I've never actually been able to understand that. <laughs> but, um, but on the other hand, we also see, you know, Google, Facebook, they've been kind of quiet on these issues. And I think it's partly because I think they're terrified that they will be regulated. Um, and I think they know that they have a pretty significant problem on their hands, particularly Facebook, which is highly monopolistic, but to some extent, Google. Uh, because of the way it's driven out competition. So I think there are really big questions. I think the smart the smart money is on keeping quiet right now, uh, but there's certainly all kinds of libertarian nonsense. I mean, think about someone like Peter Thiel, the founder of PayPal, right? Um, I mean, some of the things he said about the history of government and technology are just, you know, preposterous. Let's use the word falsehoods. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's a question. Uh from Tom Pate, is there anyone who's been able to uh, present a rebuttal to Friedman who has achieved similar influence and in circulation? Yeah, it's a really interesting point because obviously there should be, and I think part of the problem does have to do with the fact that this isn't a free marketplace of ideas, that Friedman and his ilk have been heavily promoted not just by the original funders like Harold Luna and Jasper Crane, but also by, you know, right wing media organizations, Newsweek magazine, uh, you know, that had him as a columnist for so many years. So he's had a kind of bully pulpit, a, a kind of 
Bullhorn that other academic economists who have raised questions about his arguments have not had. But that said, I do think that, you know, the tide has turned in recent years, and certainly Joe Stiglitz at Columbia um, counters Friedman's arguments in important ways, and he's a very influential person. He's been on the Council of Economic Advisors. He's a regular at Davos. So, you know, I think we do, we are hearing alternatives, but it's interesting that I would say that I don't think Joe Stiglitz, as successful and prominent as he is, has ever been a household name in the way that Milton Friedman um, has been. Okay, here's uh, here's another question from uh, Stevens professor, Dave Vicari. Uh, do introductory economics courses teach about negative externalities? Yeah, that's a great question. So I've asked my own students about this. I had a, a wonderful Harvard undergraduate, Connor Chung, who's a um, economics major, uh, help on this project. And he actually pulled out a bunch of textbooks so we could look at this very question. And what you'll see is that uh, many textbooks do mention external costs somewhere, but it's rarely highlighted. It's usually kind of maybe it's in a separate section on environmental economics if there is this section. And until pretty recently, environmental economics was considered not at all a mainstream area of economics. That has changed in recent years, and you could get a job as an environmental economist now in a way that you probably couldn't 30 years ago. But it's still not highlighted. It's still not central, even though you might think that in an era of climate change, the centrality of market failure ought to be one of the key questions of modern economics, especially if you want to preserve capitalism. One of the key questions that has to be answered is, well, how can we preserve market-based systems and also address big external costs like climate change? Um, so another question uh, from another Stevens professor, a friend of mine, uh, Michael Steinman. Um, the, your talk suggests that the uh, propaganda of, of Friedman and others was very thorough and effective. Uh, and of course, the Soviet Union had its own version of socialist propaganda. Why did the propaganda work so well in the United States? If I can put a little more of a point on that, how is it that um, working class people, people who are not reaping the benefits of capitalism have bought into this idea that businesses should be able to do whatever they choose uh, to generate profits in ways that end up hurting some of the, the working class people. Well, I think this is the key point, and it's part of why this story is so important, right, is to try to understand how propaganda works. And as you said, we were all raised, anyone raised in the Cold War was raised with the notion of Soviet propaganda, communist propaganda. Um, and we often think of propaganda prefaced by the word government, right? There's also wartime propaganda, but this is peacetime propaganda by the private sector. So why does it work, especially, as I said, because it's obviously self-serving and it's untrue. So I think there's there's two things to say to that. One is that, as all advertisers know, if you say something enough times, and if you say it persuasively, and particularly if you embed the message into things like movies and TVs and children's books, uh, you can get people to believe things even when they're not true. And in a way, that's what all advertising is about. I mean, I don't think any of us really think that, you know, our lives will be better if we use a particular toothpaste. And yet, that's what a lot of advertising is selling, right? It's not just selling that you don't get cavities, right? It's selling that you'll be more beautiful. Men will want to ask you out on dates or whatever it is, you'll, you know. So I think that's a big part of it, just the saturation. And in the book, you know, one reason the book is long is because, I could tell you that they saturated American culture with this, but you might not believe me if I didn't show you. But the other thing is that for propaganda to be effective, it has to appeal to something that people want or like or already believe in. And so this is why the use of freedom is so powerful and also so nefarious, because we all believe in freedom. And so it's linking this argument to something we all cherish. And so if I tell you, well, if you let the government you know, ban child labor, the next thing you know, they're, you're up against a firing squad. I mean, maybe people don't necessarily believe that it's that direct a link, but the idea that something important is being threatened, even by something that might on the surface appear to be beneficial, that's potentially powerful. And one thing that's interesting about this story, and again, that proves that it was propaganda and they knew it. So there's a discussion in the 1930s where a group of NAM 
um, staff are talking about the propaganda campaign and they're complaining that they're not breaking through. They're spending a lot of money, they're doing a lot of stuff, but it's not really persuading the American people. And one of the staff members says, well, the argument is kind of obviously self-serving, so we need to link it to something that Americans hold dear. And they come up with the idea of linking it to freedom. And that's when the Tripod of Freedom campaign gets launched. And when I read those documents, I found it very chilling because that's exactly what the tobacco industry did, right? The tobacco industry had a moment in which they realized, we can't really honestly say to the American people, oh, smoke our cigarettes and die of painful premature death from lung cancer. That's not really going to work. So what do we do? We invoke the idea of freedom. You don't want the government telling you whether you can or cannot smoke. And that's an argument that's persuasive to a lot of people, um, even people who don't smoke cigarettes. Okay, uh, we're, it, it's um, it's 5.05, so I think I'm gonna uh, wrap this up, but I wanna ask you one more question. So, um, uh, the relationship of this free market ideology to uh, war and militarism, you get into that uh, at, at the uh, end of your book. It's always struck me as interesting that there are some libertarians uh, who also think that we should vastly shrink our military. We should have a mil minimal min military. We shouldn't be involved in interventions um, overseas. But then you've got Ron Paul, uh, and Ron Paul sort of exemplifies that. But Ronald Reagan, obviously very hawkish, um, although he was a free market uh, believer. So I wonder if you could just comment on that and, um, I don't know, make a prediction about where that <laughs> might go. Is it possible that the, the free market people might ally with traditional liberal doves and create some kind of effective anti-war movement? Well, that's a nice thought, and they certainly should, because as you correctly point out, I mean, this is one of the tensions in libertarianism, and uh, that while arguing against big government, you know, we have this colossal gargantuan levi leviathan of a military that dwarfs any, you know, all the other militaries of the next 10 countries combined, and there's a really interesting question about why we do that, and whose interests are really being served by that. Uh, so it's a nice thought that there could be an un you know, a surprising alliance. Politics makes strange bedfellows, right? Um, you know, the future I sometimes imagine, well, I used to imagine a future, something more like the United Kingdom that once had a huge empire that was extremely costly to maintain, but eventually the United Kingdom took its place as one nation among many after it became post-imperial. The problem right now is things are such a mess in Britain that it's not a good example to use. Um, but certainly we know that imperial powers no imperial power stays in imperial power forever. And the transition to a post-imperial situation can be extremely painful or can be less painful depending upon how we approach it. So I guess I do have a dream that one day in the future, the United States will transition uh, away from this you know, huge military Leviathan, which you know, drains, drains us of resources that could obviously be used in much better ways, or at least in my opinion, could be used in much better ways. And I would gladly join forces with any libertarian who would like to help me make that argument. Can I ask one small favor? I see that Lainey Pfefferman says that her grandmother talked about the American family Robinson. So I want to invite Lainey to please send me an email about that. I would love, one great thing about writing a book is you get more stories that come your way about these things. We'd love to hear more about that if you, if you know anything more about it. So thank you all very much. This has been fun to have the opportunity to present the work today. Thank you so much, Naomi, and uh, best of luck um, promoting your book. Thank and, you. And thank you all for showing up. <laughs>